Good afternoon, everybody. We are going to start the workshop entitled Measuring Shared Strength and the Factors Affecting It. At present moment, we are 14 persons connected as panelists and uh, 42 persons connected as attendants. So we are going to wait for one minute to allow people if they are having connection problems to be incorporated to the meeting. One minute. Okay, so we can start, as uh, you know, the title of the, the workshop is Measuring Shared Strength and the Factors Affecting It. And the paper that uh, invited people to participate in this was uh, prepared by the Entelsorf, Michael Wisdom, and myself. I would like to start giving some advices particularly for those that uh, is taking uh, this workshop for first time, the origin of this uh, series of workshop, if uh, the uh, damage workshop series that uh, led by Ramesh Tarreya and Janis Barna took place after the European Conference on Composite Material uh, held in Stockholm in 2008. In one of these uh, dummy workshop series, uh, one of these dummy workshops, uh, Michael Wisdom put on the table the question on the reasonability to use the word strength to describe the properties of uh, composite material. And then we had one meeting in October 2020 with the title, How do we define and measure the strength of a composite? Then we had a second one in March 21, uh, starting with particular properties. Uh, this one was measuring United Style strength and the factors affecting it. Then we had another one in October 21, measuring UD compression strength and the factors affecting it. And at the present moment, we are having one similar associated with shear strength. Obviously, this will have a continuity and probably in the future, the NES will be transfer strength, tension and compression. And we can talk about this at the end of this uh, workshop. All of them, you can find anything related with the celebration of the first three in the directions that appear here. The objectives of uh, this series of meeting was uh, originally uh, put in the first meeting, where to discuss the concept and meaning of strength of a composite, to try to reach agreement on a definition of strength, to discuss fundamental issues with measuring strength, and to identify ne next steps to make progress. Each meeting has had their own uh, objective. With reference to cheer, we could mention, among many others, to identify the different approaches to determine shear strength, to compare the difficulties found in running the different proposal for testing a specimen to uh, obtain the shear strength value, the representativity of the values of tenning from different types of tests, and to visualize the use that the industry makes of properties associated with shear, something that we have done previously in, uh, for the other properties we have considered. 
Now, it is important to, to say that uh, the, 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 this uh, workshop does not uh, reach the end at uh, six o'clock Belgian time, because uh, depending on the meeting, we have had the uh, initiative to continue with the discussion. In particular, we um, have uh, developed a round robin uh, derived from the workshop to the, the second workshop, measuring Udite and silent strength and the factors affecting it. Here you have in this uh, screen, the institutions involved in the, in the round robin exercise. It is being at the present moment very advanced. Uh, we think we will have results uh, at the middle of the year and conclusions at the end of the year. Okay. Our Agenda is uh, in, described here. I'm now in the meeting introduction and background. There, uh, then I will make a topic presentation. Then we will enter in a 40 minute session dedicated to five minute presentations of eight panelists. Then uh, during 20 minutes, the members of the panel will have the possibility to discuss about the, the, the presentations. Then at 15.20, we will have a break of 10 minutes. And then at 15.30, we will have an open discussion and every attendant has the possibility to say what, uh, you know, which, uh, what they want to say by means either of question and answer uh, scheme or simply raising hands. The last 20 minutes will be employed in conclusion and suggestions for next steps. <clears throat> okay, this is the five minute presentations uh, panel we have, but I will introduce each of them now in the presentation of the workshop. The ground rules are that the session is being recorded. The slides will be shared afterwards, as I said previously. And during discussions, write, uh, you can write any attendant, can write. Uh, uh, a question in the question and answer session. But they will be answered during the second part of the meeting. You can raise hand also just during the second part of the meeting. There is no camera for audience, only micros will be open after raising hand. And there is a chat, but please use the chat only for general comment, familiar comment to say hi and, and that's all we will not have time to take care of the chat. So now entering into the presentation, how do we measure shared strength of composite and the factors affecting it? Um, I would like to say, first of all, that in our first workshop, we defined strength, you know, a, a concept that uh, we are discussing is if applied to composite, as the maximum stress that the material can sustain under uniform uniacial loading and in the absence of other stress components. Shear strength is probably the most complicated property to be determined due to the difficulty of obtaining the two conditions we have mentioned, a uniform shear stress state with no other stress component. The determination of other strength properties like XT, XC, YT, YC presents a series of difficulties that are common to almost all of them, like geometry, how to enter the loading into the specimen, the presence of nominal singular uh, stress states, difficulty in getting uniform distribution of stresses, etc. A discussion on shear strength determination presents versus other strength properties, a significant difference. There are different approaches to determine it, all of them having the same difficulties as those previously mentioned. So we ought to have an equivalent workshop for each one of the alternative ways of testing a specimen to determine the property S. But this is impossible to do it. So we are going to share all the approaches in this workshop in an organized way. Okay, most of the work to estimate shear strength was done, you will see it, in the 80s and 90s of the past century. Although recently, some new ideas uh, 
which is to indicate that the determination must still is an open matter, have appeared. You will have, in any case, the possibility to hear people that uh, made the most interesting development during the decades of the 80s and the 90s. We have tried in this way to invite to this workshop some of the most significant authors that were involved in research of the main procedures considered to determine shear strength, as well as those who have recently presented some new insights on the existing procedures and have introduced some new ideas. Most of them are covered in our paper that it is published by Michael Gentle and myself, and you can find in the web. The first is test I'm going to talk about is the rail chair test and Vinochet real uh, rail chair. The test was originally proposed in '67, and probably is the most intuitive to try to generate a pure chair stress state. Adam Setal in 2003 proposed the Vinochet real chair test, substituting the rectangular specimen on the left hand side by a double notch one and gripping by friction on the right hand side. This test still struggles with stress concentrations and a lack of uniform chair stresses. This test uh, uh, will be, I mean, the, 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 the comment on this test will be covered by Dan Adams uh, from Wyoming test features that we'll talk in first place. The second, the Yosipescu test, the second I'm going to comment, the Yosipescu test is very well known. It's, you have the, the scheme here. And uh, it was a test uh, proposed in 67 by Yosipescu to quantify the shear strength of metals and was extended in the 80s to determine the shear modulus and shear strength of composites using the modified Wyoming specimen. The main advantages of the test are related to its simplicity and the creation of a region, I would say, dominated by shear stresses. The disadvantages concern the premature failure due to a stress concentration originated by the gripping system, the misalignment of the specimen, the twisting and irregular load distribution, and the need to apply a correction factor for non-uniform stress. Then others will also clarify all these points and will take care of this particular test. Now, the third is the plus minus 45 tensile test. As you know, this is a test on a symmetric plus minus 45 laminate subjected to tension. This is good for measuring the nonlinear st stress strain response, but the stress state is not pure shear, and the failure may be influenced by the stacking sequence, the number of plies, free edge effects, and large rotations, among other questions. Kela et al. observed a significant scale effect in strength and reported a transition in failure mode in a scaled specimens for certain laminate stacking sequences. John Morton, co-author of the paper I have mentioned by Kela et al., uh, will uh, give us some insight on the, um, the scale effect in this type of test. John Morton from Imperial College. Now, another promising test was the off-axis tension test. Okay, the test is performed with the fiber not coinciding in the aggression with loading. It may be considered the simplest test to induce indirectly shear stress because to apply tension is the, 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 the easiest way to work in a lab. Problem associated with the coupling of normal and shear stress component arose, as well as the ways to minimize them. All these have been extensively reported in the literature. These solutions include correction factors from experimental results, modification of the test configuration to reproduce the ideal test configuration, the use of oblique tabs and the ultimate choice of the tab angles. Fabrice Pierron from the University of Southampton will illustrate all this matter. 
Now, the fifth more common used or referred test is tube torsion test. That is illustrated in this picture. Now, the tube torsion test introduces a torsion moment in a tube made of unidirectional pliers. While it generates a reasonably uniform and pure shear stress state, this configuration has the drawback of its cost, complexity, and I would add representativity, because the quality of a tube and hence its shear behavior may not be representative of the behavior of a flat laminate. Marino Poresimin from University of Padua will illustrate us with the difficulties in testing tubular specimens. There are many others, but uh, at least I would like to mention the shear frame test and the biaxial tension compression test that have been the object of recent publications. In any case, we are going to have two more contributions associated with intralaminar shear strength. One is the development of S specimen geometry that is going to be uh, presented by Shankar Kalyanasundaram, sorry for the pronunciation, Shankar, from the Australian National University and some consideration on getting the shear strength in composite by Alberto Barroso from the University of Sydney. Uh, in this case, the, the, the object is to see the presence of uh, places where you can have uh, um, premature failure and can condition the result obtained. Also, we are going to have two contributions, the seventh and the eighth, associated with interlaminar strength. The six previous were associated with intralaminar strength. We are talking now about SIMA 1.3 and the corresponding allowable S13. There is a typical device. Uh, to determine uh, this property with uh, three points of application of loading and uh, is the one you see on the left hand side. Okay, I have to say that uh, in a company, in a spin off company we had, this was the test we performed more frequently, most or near 50% uh, of the tests we performed are talking about 50,000 corresponded to this test. Why this test? This test is used for the aeronautical industry for production control, independently of the use as determination of property. This is the cheapest one and indicates if there is a problem with the uh, quality of the production. The first uh, paper will be presented by Michael Wisnon talking about the size effect uh, with this particular um, device. And finally, uh, Gang Thu from Lafuru University will talk about the double beam chair, which appear represented on the right hand side with five points of uh, application of loading, two direct application of loading, three as support. I would like to conclude with a viewpoint of the industry. I, in the previous uh, um, in the previous uh, workshop, I have always tried to see how the industry see our, our work. And um, in the aeronautical industry, the most used procedure is plasma 45, no doubt. Why? Because it's the cheapest. They consider it's the cheapest, which is the problem. The problem is that S is determined from panel uh, different from those used to determine other properties. I mentioned this before. What I have learned from them, from the industry, is that uh, they take, they, in fact, they don't calculate S. They calculate a lower limit of S because it's taking as the value of the nominal shear stress existing for a certain deformation at which the test is interrupted. In the space industry, they use EOCP SQ test and get G12 and S. This is our experience after 15 years working for these two uh, sectors. The previous comments directly indicate the relative use that uh, the aeronautical uh, industry make of S to design components made of composite. So the final reflection that you have here corresponds to the fact that uh, although we have uh, made a special emphasis on the advantage and drawbacks of each step, 
it is obvious that there is a long list of concerns, long list. For instance, zero versus 90 plus orientation, voidage, loading rate, environmental conditions, effect of all the shared component, presence of nominally singular stresses uh, are with no doubt on this list. Although our introduction has primarily addressed to in-plane shared strength, some of the methods can also be applied to measure interlaminar shear strength. And the relation between these two properties is another interesting question that will be addressed in some of the presentations. So to conclude, as a plenary preliminary statement, we understand that further research with reliable test methods is required to fully understand the factors affecting the determination of the shear strength of composites. So it's now time, I conclude, uh, it's now time for Dan Adams to start his presentation. Dan, you can open micro, micro and camera and you are sharing the screen. Perfect, you can start. Okay. Are you seeing my screen? Because I am not. Yeah, one second, there is a problem. You try to share it again, Dan. I don't I've got the wrong presentation. Dan, if you just, oh, just okay. share the screen. Now, Dan, we can see. I don't know why appear the presentation of Dan. Okay. 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 Well, thank you very much and good afternoon. Um, as was mentioned, I will be speaking about uh, V-naught shear testing of composite laminae and laminates. Um, as mentioned, I work at uh, Wyoming Test Fixtures, which is a family business that my father started. I'm also an emeritus professor uh, at the University of Utah. So when we talk about uh, optimal shear testing, uh, one of the questions is what, what do you mean by optimal? What attributes come to mind? And so I've listed four things here that uh, as I go along that uh, kind of use as discriminators. So a uniform state of shear stress within the test section and uh, pure shear in the sense that uh, only shear stresses, no other stress components acting, normal stresses and so forth. We would like the uh, stresses, shear stresses in the test section to be higher than other portions of the specimen. So we will get failure there. And finally, we would like a shear failure produced. So when we speak of the uh, V-notch uh, shear tests, there's now actually three of them. Two of them were covered in the introduction. So the, the uh, V-notch beam test or the OSPESQ shear uh, it was standardized by ASTM um, back in the 1980s. Um, the V-notch rail shear test, which uh, my students and I at the University of Utah worked on developing, um, was standardized in 2005. And you can see the uh, relative sizes of the fixtures as well as the specimens. And then our most recent contribution is what we call the combined loading shear. So it takes, as we'll talk about here in a second, and loads both the, both the edges and the faces, and we can test higher shear strength laminates. So starting with the V-notch beam test, um, many of you, I believe, are familiar with this one. And it uses a relatively small specimen, rectangular specimen that has uh, machined V-notches in the top and bottom. Uh, 90 degrees, although um, you can use different um, angles if you wish to try and uh, uh, positively affect the stress state. The loading is an asymmetrical four-point flexure. You can see the uh, cartoon at the bottom, and that's important in the sense that uh, you see the left and the right hand on opposite sides of the specimen. So we don't have to worry about the loading going through uh, discrete points using rollers. We can have uh, loading along the entire edges because we don't need to calculate the, uh, the moments produced, if you will, in the shear force um, by the application points of the load. 
The second, uh, the VNOS rail shear test uh, was originally standardized, as I mentioned, in 2005. And this was really meant as a replacement to the rail shear test that was uh, brought up at the introduction, which was uh, ASTM 4255, I think. The rectangular of, uh, rail shear test suffered from a very non-uniform stress distribution. So the idea is to take the notched configuration of the Yosepescu um, test and scale up the size by a factor of three. And then if you will, to cut off the, 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 the wings on either side. And the idea being that now the load is introduced through the faces of the specimen as opposed to the edges. Um, the advantages are a larger gauge section. So now you have more space in the test section uh, to test uh, fabrics, uh, textile composites, if you will, that have a coarser, larger gauge section, and also the opportunity to get more load into the specimen by loading the faces of the specimen rather than the edges, which tend to start experiencing crushing under higher loads. The third test, which uh, we're in the initial stages of standardizing is combined loading shear. And so basically it incorporates the loading in the previous two methods that uh, I brought up that the uh, 5379, uh, which is edge loaded as well as the face loaded. And in this particular case, the size of the specimen is the same as the v rail shear, but the ends, the wings, if you will, have been extended another 25 millimeters to provide uh, increased both edge loading and face loading. And the whole idea behind this was the fact that when we developed the D7078, the V-notch rail shear, people immediately started using it to test the shear strength of multi-directional laminates. And uh, it failed to be able, to, we failed in the sense that we were not able to get enough load into high shear strength laminates uh, to actually provide uh, failure. So the combined loading shear was developed in the hopes of being able to go from laminate to uh, laminates and in fact high shear strength uh, composite laminates. So we talk about this stress distribution in the um, test section and these are um, numerical simulation results for a total of four different laminates if you will and looking just at the v-notched region the contours represent uh, regions of constant uh, shear stress and uh, the colors now, the, the, the warmer colors are stress concentrations and the, the cooler colors, the blues and the greens are where the stresses are lower than the average value from notch to notch. First thing you see is when you look on the far left, the all zero degree specimen uh, suffers from from a very non-uniform stress state uh, in the region between the notches. There's a relatively significant stress concentration near the notches. And in the center of the test section, the shear stress is actually a little bit below the average value. As you move across, you notice that uh, these other laminates, cross-ply, quasi-isotropic, and all plus minus 45, uh, suffer less from the non-uniformity of the uh, shear stress. And in fact, you have a, a region in the center of the specimen where in fact the average shear stress in the region uh, is actually, the shear stress is equal to the average value. And so this is significant in the sense that if you want to move forward with this test with laminates, you see that you actually have an opportunity to test uh, um, other than just the zero. And in fact, there's a reason to believe, as I mentioned in the last workshop with uh, compression, that there are some benefits to actually performing the uh, V-notched tests with cross-ply laminates, the 090s rather than zero, because it changes the orthotropy ratio of the laminate and makes the uh, stress state more favorable in the test section. This plot now shows the load applied to these um, high shear strength laminates um, to get failure. And so we've, we've plotted both the uh, D7078 and this combined loading shear CLS with two lengths of specimens. And the arrow up on top points to the uh, highest load that we've ever had to apply. And, that we have applied to get failure in a specimen. So you see we're about 100 kilonewtons 
And that actually was for a, a quasi isotropic uh, laminate um, to, to get a shear failure. And I actually have a, a photo here of the specimen and, and sitting next to me is the actual specimen. So you can get a feel for just how, how big this is. About 10 millimeters thick. And so um, this is what a shear failure looks like in a quasi isotropic laminate. And uh, the first thing that people normally will uh, say when they look at this and have thought about it for a little bit is that uh, that looks like a very complex failure. And in fact, it's not really a shear failure on apply sense because of course you're testing a multi-directional laminate. So we have to kind of change our, um, the way that we speak about things in terms of uh, what we're looking for here. But the point is that we are applying now shear loading to that center v naught section. And of course the laminate, the multi-directional laminate is gonna fail in whatever manner it sees fit. So just to, uh, to conclude, if I go back to my initial slide about what attributes come to mind for optimal testing, um, we have to think a little bit about changing the way that we express the uniform state of shear stress, because as I mentioned in a, a laminate, you're not going to be, um, the plies will not have um, pure shear, nor will they necessarily um, fail in shear as the last bullet provides. But nonetheless, there is a great interest in testing for the shear strength of multi-directional laminates. And the final thought is the reason for that is because currently it's a very difficult property to predict. Um, if you just go to laminated plate theory with uh, applied discount methods for reducing when you get uh, uh, damage present in the plies, you'll see that it's very difficult to actually predict shear strength. And in fact, it's very difficult to measure. So we feel we have some opportunities to do the measurement using this uh, combined loading shear test. And that's all I have for you this afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, I hope we will have the opportunity to meet you later on. I will try. Thank you. All right. I have to say before giving the, the, the possibility to talk to the next speaker that Dan had a problem with the attendance and I have given him the possibility to use more minutes. And this is not allowed for the rest of the presenters. Okay. So, John. Okay. John, John Morton is the next speaker. We are going to share from here. The presentation, John, ready? Five minutes? Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Federico. Um, as Federico said at the beginning of his introduction, um, we did some work on plus minus 45 degree composites loaded in tension. And our primary aim was to look at scale effects in carbon fiber composites. So this was work done in the late 80s, early 90s, and it was funded by NASA Langley in Virginia. And I was at Virginia Tech at the time. So I, I'm really going to sort of summarize some of the work we did that was published in the ASTM STP 1156. But I'm also going to add some unpublished data that was produced by my former student Mingyi Sai. So next slide, please. So what did we do? We, we took some plus minus 45 degree uh, tensile specimens, and we scaled all of the dimensions, length, width, thickness, and in some of the composites, we scaled the ply thickness by stacking plies of similar orientation. And what did we get? We got that whole range of responses that went from brittle strain to failure about half a percent with 32 blocked plies up to quasi ductile with 32 distributed plies and a strain to failure of almost 12 and a half percent in composites. Again, as Federica mentioned with the plus minus 45 degree specimen, what you have is what you have is um, at a laminar level, you've got combined shear and tension in the plus and minus 45 degrees. So essentially you could have 
tensile strengths, or if you divide those by two, shear strengths going from 45 megapascals up to 120 if you use European units. Yeah. So what does that mean? If I can have the next slide. Yeah. So I've already commented on the range of um, behaviors, the uh, sorts of stresses you get that are tensile plus shear. But I wanted to emphasize that there are also in these composites residual stresses. And at the time, we were sort of quite surprised that certainly with the blocked, uh, thick ply specimens, the residual stresses were large enough to cause a network of cracks in the laminates, even before loading. The thinner specimen didn't show the cracks, but they were the, the stresses were there, uh, which could later be combined with the applied stresses. Another observation that I'm gonna sort of emphasize later is that while we sometimes say the fiber volume fraction is nominally 60%, actually, if you look at a microscopic scale, you get local um, three fibers touching and a nominal highly localized fiber volume fraction of 90, 91%. And of course, in the laminates, you have free edge effects. So these all come into play that will affect our sort of ideal world of having uniform stress systems in these tests. Next slide, please. So I've already mentioned residual stresses causing cracking. Uh, I think the process consists of, first of all, find three fibers touching and you'll get a micro crack emanating from those, possibly, probably even just under the residual stresses. Those cracks can then grow until they hit another laminate and they will delaminate at the, the uh, ply interface in the Cook and Gordon model. And this is where I would suggest that there's a statistical effect. The more fibers you have in a ply, the more chance there are of those three fibers touching or three fibers close together. And I think that is a key factor. And when we looked at the cracking even caused before the load was applied, we had a much bigger crack density, almost four times the crack density in the middle of the laminate where they apply thickness is effectively double. Yep. So the more fibers, the more chance of cracks, and therefore you get these uh, cracks at the laminate level. And then finally, you've got the network of 45 degree cracks, and you get ductility in the distributed specimens by sliding and rotating of those crack blocks. So that tends to be the process and I'd say primarily under tensile stresses rather than shear. Next slide. Yeah, just wanted to comment briefly. These are uh, displacement pictures. The one on the left-hand side uh, should be straight parallel lines. You can see some textures associated with plus and minus 45. If you take the uniform stress off, you can see non-uniform displacements. And if you look at the edge, you can even see free edge effects. Next slide. And if you convert those to strains, you can see at a macro level, millimeter level, really, you can see non-uniform strains, maybe plus minus 15% in the plus minus 45 degree specimens. That's on a, yeah, in a composite. And in case you think that is confined to the plus and minus 45 degree specimens, I've thrown in some results we got from off-axis tests. So that's a single ply. So even with a 10 degree off-axis, you get 10 to 12 and a half percent variation in um, strains, which yeah, is hardly uniform stress state. Last slide, please. Yeah. So I ask really the questions, what are the implications of this, uh, these observations for shear property measurement. Sh 
strength measurement generally, even the strength definition, what does it mean for composite modeling? And of course, how do these affect the design of carbon fiber composites? These in fact were questions we asked 30 years ago. And I think one of the applications of this was for the Boeing 787. So I think we've already designed it and flying it, but the questions remain. Thank you, Federico. I hope I haven't spoken for much more than five minutes. Okay, let's move to the next speaker who is going to be Fabrice. Fabrice, can you share your screen with your presentation? Right. Can you can you see it, Federico? Yes. Good. Okay. Right, so I'm going to um, present you some stuff that um, I did a long time ago. Actually, I had to do a bit of archaeology uh, when I was preparing this um, this presentation because I slightly shifted my research interest towards full field measurements um, since the last sort of 15 years. Um, so I'm Fabrice Pierrot. I'm a professor at the University of Southampton in the UK. I'm also um, R&D director at a company I co-founded in, in Belgium called Match ID. So uh, um, briefly, the principle of the test, uh, as was described uh, before by uh, Federico in his uh, presentation, you apply a tensile load to a uniaxial uh, composite, a UD composite, which fibers lie at certain angles theta from the axis of the tensile specimen. Now, what happens if you do that? Instead of having um, um, a rectangular deformed shape, um, you have a rotation of the, um, of, of the end of the specimen. And that's called by the uh, shear coupling term here. This is SXS, which is the uh, shear coupling compliance, which gives you a shear strain uh, in the uh, global axis of the test. And this is a representation here of that angle. Now, because of that, when you apply real boundary conditions, so you claim that in the test machine, what happens is you're not allowing the ends to rotate. And, you, and so you have this very well-known S-shaped deformation. And that creates stress concentrations, as you can visualize here. That's from a finite element model. Uh, the nominal uh, value of the stress is one that was normalized. And you see very high stress concentrations here, 1.7, 1.8, uh, close to the ends. In the uh, 90s, City Sun um, and Il Sub Chung came up with a very elegant solution to that problem. Uh, so this is the analysis. So if you apply a uniform pressure at the end of that specimen, you get this parallelogram deformation. If you plot the longitudinal displacement field, so that's the, um, the actual displacement. If there was no coupling, you would have straight vertical lines, but because of the coupling, you have oblique lines here. And so uh, this angle is a function of the, of the uh, coupling compliance SXS over the longitudinal compliance. And the idea of uh, a Chung and um, Sun was to apply the displacement on this theoretical line of isodisplacement, which is schematized here uh, you, as, as an oblique tab, okay? So if you do that, then what you do is you recover um, the, the, the um, um, longitudinal uniform pressure, so situation applied to the specimen, uh, you, you're still constraining Poisson's ratio, however, so you're still going to have some stress concentrations, but much, much less. We did a validation of this uh, experimentally uh, some years back, uh, and we even had uh, um, oblique grips in our little bespoke test machine, so we could really have neat boundary conditions. At the time, we used the grid method because um, the IC wasn't, wasn't there. Also, um, so some very nice um, uh, legacy measurements uh, uh, from John Morton's uh, presentation. It's nice to dig these ones up. Um, so you see here, this is the longitudinal displacement along the specimen. And when you have no tabs, you see that these ISO displacement lines, they're nearly vertical close to the, the grip, and then they gradually get inclined as you move towards the uh, middle of the specimen. 
if you put in some um, um, some tabs, still straight, but uh, glass epoxy tabs, you allow a little bit of rotation because of the deformation of the tabs, which show here as a certain uh, inclination, but you still have the, this line rotating. Well, if you use oblique tab, you see you end up with very nice uh, uniformly spaced uh, ISO displacement lines. In terms of longitudinal strain, you can see the same effect, no end tabs, you have significant strain concentration. Um, with glass epoxy tabs, you reduce these. With oblique tabs, you have a near uniform uh, state of stress, or strain, sorry. So we looked at the fracture stress obtained with this different configuration. That's just a picture here. Um, with straight um, composite tabs, you see a fracture in the, in the tab with a mean fracture stress of 66, while when we use the oblique tabs, we were able to in increase that value. And, and uh, most of the time, we had failure um, away from the grips. We use different configurations so, um, with straight aluminum tabs, very low apparent strength. Uh, when we uh, went to a more compliant tabs, you see this value increases. Uh, for oblique aluminum tabs, it's even higher. And if you add a little bit more compliance with oblique glass epoxy tabs, you get a slight improvement. So quite a large difference from uh, aluminum tabs, straight aluminum tabs to oblique tabs. I just want to finish with this slide. Um, because here, one of the problems with that test is you do not have uh, pure shear. So if you look at the shear uh, stress distribution in the material axis, um, and if you focus on the 2-2 two, two and 1-2 components, so in the shear transverse tension plane, uh, you get a significant amount of sigma 2-2. Two, two. So we get about 78 uh, megapascal for uh, the shear fracture stress with this T300914. But if we want to take into account uh, the presence of transverse uh, stress here, then we can correct that using a, a failure criterion. Here we use Tsai Vu, which isn't great, but it's in, in the transverse uh, tension shear plane is reasonable. Uh, we actually have an, an increased value of that. Interestingly, we also did some Yoshi Pescu uh, zero degree shear test on which I did my PhD. And in that case, you have the reverse situation because you have uh, the presence of transverse compression. And here, the apparent failure stress we get is much higher. But if you correct it again for transverse compression this time, it brings it down to about the same level as we had with the, uh, the 10 degree of axis. Right, this is all I wanted to present. Thank you, Federico. Thank you, Fabrice. Now we will move to the next presentation by Marino Quarisimin from the University of Padua. Padova, who is going to talk about testing tubular specimens. Can you allow me to share the screen? Yes. Actually, I have two connections. Okay, try with the second one. One second. We are... Okay, okay. I can do with it. I have two computers. We see you now. Okay. We see you now, but we would prefer to see your presentation. Yes, sorry. <laughs> so uh, share a screen. Okay, can you get the presentation now? Now, okay, go ahead. Federico? Yeah? Can you get me? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for the invitation. Actually, uh, Federico already <clears throat> introduced the work. So basically, it's a summary of the activity done in the last year by myself and Paolo, which is here with me. Uh, well, actually, the, the, all the activity we've done on tubes uh, was originally meant uh, uh, for, uh, mainly for multi-action fatigue testing and fatigue purposes. But, uh, uh, we have done a lot of activity just in development of the <clears throat> of the test procedure and the, the manufacturing of the specimens. So there is a lot of uh, information that we believe are suitable for uh, to be shared with uh, the colleagues and the friends uh, present today. Uh, well, as introduced, uh, our, the philosophy in this case was uh, to introduce uh, pure shear stress on using uh, tubes under torsion. And at this level, uh, two options. Uh, I mean, the first one is the, to put uh, the fiber, uh, if you use original, uh, uh, sorry, unidirectional uh, tapes uh, along the zero direction, but uh, uh, I would say more or less impossible to manufacture uh, the, the, the tubes uh, 
as uh, I will show later on, because uh, um, you have a lot of uh, during the, the molding phase or even during the, the manufacturing of the sample. So the best solution is to use uh, unidirectional uh, um, tapes of rapid uh, tape 90 degree angle uh, uh, with respect to the, the tube axis. And, uh, and in this case, uh, what you can do, okay, you can of course introduce only sigma six. In this case, you have only sigma six on the specimen, but uh, if you add a uh, Within our uh, um, actual load, you can also combine tension and torsion, and this allows uh, the, the multi-actual response of the material to be tested, but this is not the case of, of, of this talk. Getting back to the, um, to the tubular test under pure torsion, uh, you have, of course, uh, the typical uh, linear distribution of the shear stresses from the inside, from the internal to external uh, thickness uh, and wall. Uh, Basically, what you can uh, derive is that the difference in terms of uh, relative value can be easily calculated according to the linear distribution. So from this uh, formula, it's rather easy to understand that uh, the, the, the lower, uh, uh, sorry, the larger the, the tube diameter and the thinner the thickness of the, the wall, the, the better, in the sense that you lower the stress gradient and at the same time you lower the effect of curvature. Uh, because if you have, particularly if you have smaller, uh, small diameter uh, tubes, uh, the effect of curvature can be significant. Uh, however, we, we test uh, samples uh, at uh, 20 millimeters uh, diameter uh, as well as 40. And uh, if you compare those results uh, with um, results coming from um, flat panels or flat sample, the, the, the difference is not that big. So it's reasonably similar. We didn't do in any case a pragmatic uh, investigation. Um, and in, in our case, we use uh, mandrel wrapping uh, from starting from unidirect, unidirectional pre preg, uh, and then uh, we um, close the the, the tube with a heat shrinking tape, uh, which is a rather uh, practical way to do the, the, the wrapping, as you see in the ra right picture. Uh, we put uh, some local reinforcement uh, to uh, the, um, the molding phase, which is rather heavy using a number or similar tools. And then from the panel, sorry, from the tube, you manufacture, um, you can cut the sample uh, in the length you need. Uh, wrapping is rather easy because you can really wrap a pre pre tape and then uh, cook, cure in an oven. And uh, sometimes, uh, particularly uh, not necessarily for shear, but for compression on tubes, uh, um, fillet uh, rising can help in uh, avoiding uh, tub failure, which is in any case, not very frequent in the case of um, torsion testing. Uh, the thinking tape can induce some uh, surface defect, which can uh, at the end uh, act as a starting uh, of the cracks. So in this case, uh, you can uh, make work uh, with a most, uh, you know, more uh, careful uh, the position of the tape or either changing the layup. Uh, for instance, you can have the, the Internal thick part uh, of the, 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 um, the ply oriented at 90 degree with the longitudinal axis and putting some uh, very thin uh, internal and fabric layers to prevent uh, the, the formation of surface defects, which indeed uh, at the end uh, uh, affect uh, failure. Therefore, machining is not an, an option because uh, another way to calibrate the tube could be to machine at the surface, uh, but you are basically destroying, as you see here surface and so this is something we tried to see but uh, we didn't go in this direction uh trying to get to the end uh, just with our uh, chairman to get nervous clamping is rather tricky because uh, uh if you have a tubular specimen you have to use a uh, tubular cylindrical clamping and grips just to, to to wrap correctly the 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 specimen but in this case uh, what you have is that you can test only relatively smaller uh, uh, tubes. And uh, in this case, uh, you can use a um, keyless uh, locking device based on the, the friction concept there, like this one, where you basically clamp, uh, sorry, let me add, uh, so if you see my mouse, you clamp the internal uh, ring uh, to the specimen, you clamp the external uh, uh, surface uh, or a cap, which is at the end, uh, um, prepared to be hosted in the, the grips of the machine. So this is the detail, so you have the specimen 
and the connection to the testing machine. Uh, tubes allows a very easy, if you're testing glass epoxy image monitoring, because if you put a LED lights inside, it's very cheap. A few euros, you do the job and you can easy, easily see the cracks dropping into the specimen. Uh, about the results, uh, basically this is a, a summary of uh, the results we got under a multi-action campaign. Uh, this is the value we, we, we got for uh, the, the glass epoxy tubes we tested. And uh, as I said, compared with similar panel, uh, with, sorry, with panels and specimen taken from the same material, but uh, laminated under flat condition, the results are relatively similar for uh, the same thickness. In conclusion, well, advantages of tubular specimens, uh, no free edges at all, uh, because you are working on a, a cylindrical surface. You, are in, you can induce uh, pure shear without any other uh, influence, well, without the influence of any other component. But at the same time, playing with the, like you playing with, uh, the external loading, you can also investigate uh, the effect of uh, a small amount of, of uh, uh, other stress, stress components like Sigma 2 or uh, Sigma 1 if you work uh, with uh, the zero configuration. So from this uh, test, you can direct uh, assess uh, the shear strength in the modulus as well as constitutive load. Uh, there are no uh, stress concentration and uh, a very a limited uh, stress gradient uh, related to the linear distribution of, uh, of the stresses uh, over the thickness. Uh, said already about the possibility to combine different loads. Uh, drawbacks, uh, as you have seen, it's not very easy to manufacture the samples, but we, we managed to, to learn uh, rather quickly. And uh, after some, uh, some dedicated to that, uh, so it's reasonably stable. And of course, you need a, tension, a torsion machine, which can be either multi axial in tension and torsion. Okay, sorry, this is the end. Just let me use one second to tell you that. Uh, uh, we are organizing a, a summer school on the subject that we will be in July in our department. I get back to this uh, uh, later if there is a bit of time on that. Thank you very much. Okay, Marina, thank you very much. Let's move to the next presentation. The development of S specimen geometry integrated with big system to elucidate shear failure by Shankar uh, from Australian National University. Shankar, it's your turn. Wow, impressive. Okay, go ahead. Open Shankar, open the micro and the camera and you are sharing the screen, but please open micro and camera. Yeah, okay, I'm um, opening it. Uh, share everything, okay? Yeah. Start the video. Go ahead. Go yeah. ahead. Everything okay? Everything, everything okay. okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, okay, oh, yeah. Now, um, I want to sort of saying something very interesting, okay? I probably had the shortest number of slides, there are only four. Okay, so the idea here is, this is what was kind of in my head. What is shear failure? Okay. What well, more importantly is about establishing metrics for the shear failure. So we came up with this um, setup, uh, experimental setup out here. What you can see here, the setup is that, you know, this experimental setup there, where what we have is that you know, the specimen now there, you got something pushing it down and you got a DIC system. So the idea here is to change the specimen geometry. Change the specimen geometry for multiple things out there. 
So what is different? Different testing uh, uh, schemes that are there. One experimental methodology in apparatus. We don't want to have different types of, uh, you know, set up for testing different things. What we want to do here is to look at one experimental methodology, but we want to look at different deformation modes. That's the idea. So what we have here, if you look at that, um, at the principal strain space, you can have a multi-axial stage of, you know, strain synthesis from equal biaxial tension all the way to pure shear. The second thing that we want to elucidate is a path dependency of loading. Then we what? Well, then what we want to do is by integrating this concept, the DIC, which measures strain evolution in real time during loading, we can look at you know the effect of path dependency, okay, and the effect of loading different deformation modes. So this is not about pure shear alone. It's about everything. When you think about pure shear alone, you know, it's not, you know, it's, a, it's not a complete picture. When you go back and look at what a structural component, you know, uh, basis, it will experience different, you know, states of stress states, by excess states. You will have normal stresses, complex stresses, you will have shear stresses. Idea is that how do you come up with a testing metric? How do you come up with a testing metric so that this metric should be, you know, usable. People talked about that before. This is complementary to what everybody is doing before. It is about how do you come up with a failure metric that can be incorporated at an element level in an FEA simulation. That was the goal. That was the goal. That was the goal. So what we found was that we found that I, I'm very confident that you know from here, there, 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 I know how to predict it at an element level. Not sure here, not sure here. So that was the thing that I want to present today. When it's not going from that tension to pure shear, very gray area, gray area, very gray area. What does it mean? Okay, what do you find? Shear strain and failure behavior very different. My research is based on woven thermoplastic composite materials. I find that fiber matrix D and lots of things can happen. I was able to create pure, you know, shear stress slash strain. But that does not 
is not the full picture. It's not the full picture. It's not the whole picture. You know, you can, you know, you can have in, in this case, you know, the, the 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 things like you know the beef can change. We tried on four different materials. Four different materials, from plastic materials. And we found that the properties of the fiber and the matrix can influence the failure. Shankar, could you please go to the conclusions? Yeah, I will, I'll go to the conclusion right now. Yeah. That's my conclusion. Is she a fair dominant of the matrix? Wisdom says, that you know is dominated by the matrix. No, definitely not sure with uh, with some plastic composites. Are there low transfer issues that needs to be accounted with failure matrix? If so, what can you do? How can you do this? You know, to have things where we say, look, this is what's happening. I think it's not good enough. We have to have a way of saying that, how can we use it? That's what I want to have a discussion going here. And that's all I would say. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. I thought uh, that you had only four pages, but you have uh, a lot of things to say. <laughs> okay, let's move to the next one. It's uh, Alberto from the University of Seville. Alberto. Hi, I'm trying to initiate my video, but it says I can't. The host has stopped it. But I can put them. Okay, okay, let's start. Can you see the slides? No? Yes. Yes, so now I can share my video now. All right, thank you. So thank you very much and good afternoon. I'm trying to be brief. And these are some, some ideas in a general topic, not an specific uh, testing about with some considerations on, on getting the the, the strengths that we are discussing this afternoon. So this is a work of my of, of, of the group, my colleagues, Federico Paris and Juan Carlos Marin. And the idea, oh, I'm sorry. All right. So the idea I, I introduced in the previous workshop, some difficulties of having premature failures uh, when you have some specimens with these critical points where material and geometry change abruptly. So we found some preliminary failures and now in the topic of today, we have also experience in some of the tests. For example, in Yosipescu, the contact points between the specimen and the device creates critical points where linear elastically speaking, these stresses are unbounded. And also in the off-axis test, as perfectly explained by Fabrice, uh, we have some, some problems with these failures near the top. So due to the time that we have, we, I will only focus on this topic and some ideas on the cruciform specimens. In the off-axis, I, I think I will skip this because it was perfectly explained by Fabrice. Uh, we have to use these uh, oblique taps to avoid these bending moments appearing at the gripping system. But these angle taps, the, tap, the, the angle of this tap depends on the property I'm trying to measure and obviously on the orientation of the fiber. Uh, the potential failure or parameter failures standing, starting at these corners 
are have two locations mainly, but one is critical. This uh, this is the general configuration in which we have two geometrical or material parameters, which are the angle of the tab and the angle of the fiber. And we have that the tab inclination, which depends on the solution of the problem, depends obviously on, on all the stiffness properties, including the shear stiffness. So if we, if we want to measure shear strength and we are using these oblique taps, we have to, to prevent these primitive failures starting at these corners where uh, stresses are high. This is the most critical corner because if failure starts here, it can run along the, the sample without breaking any fiber. At the opposite side, if you have failure starting at the other corner, it will not progress because it has to, to break fiber. So we will concentrate on corner A. I will obtain the stress singularities, these stress concentrations at this corner, and we will focus on this, the order of the stress singularities, which depend on the local geometry, the local material properties, and the local boundary conditions. These premature failures are dependent of a lot of geometrical aspects. Here you see some failures at the top corner with different ratio of the specimens. As long as the ratio of the specimen, the, the ratio of the length divided by the width, as long as this ratio is higher, the problems with these premature failures is lower, but not because the stress singularity is lower. The local geometry and material configuration is exactly the same, but the stress intensity factors are lower when the ratio is higher. So what we have done is uh, to avoid using very long ratio specimens, we have calculated for all the fiber orientations and uh, we, for all the fiber orientation, the order of stress singularities and have found that there are some combinations of fiber orientation and tap angle, which uh, banish the stress singularities. So in this optimal axis, of axis test configuration, we have one requirement due to the angle of the tab to comply with the uh, ISO displacement line. And we have a requirement for avoiding this stress concentration of the singularities and have found that the best solution with the lowest, lower differences between the tab angle and the angle for no singularity is the use of 10 degrees. Uh, we have also made a lot of uh, testing and comparisons obtaining with this cruciform testing, which is a very easy way. It, it needs a biaxial machine, but it's a very easy way to introduce a uniform and pure shear stress at the center of the, of the tab. Here you can see the fiber direction, but here, although you don't have stress singularities, you have to be very careful with the stress concentrations at the, at the geometry of the sample. So these are some reference and that's all from my side. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alberto. Okay, we will move now to the last two presentations, both corresponding to interlaminar shear strength. The first will be carried out by Michael Wisdom from the University of Bristol. Michael. Thank you very much. So I'm talking about size effects and also comparing interlaminar and in-plane shear. So some years ago, we did a series of scale tests on an old material, a high strength carbon epoxy material using the short beam shear tests. The short beam shear test is widely used as, uh, as Federico mentioned earlier, largely perhaps as a quality control, but actually I think it's, it's quite good for measuring shear strength. One of the problems is you have to be careful to make sure that the, the roller is big enough so you don't get a local compressive failure where you load it, but provided you avoid that, uh, you can get some quite good results. What we show here is four tests where all the dimensions were doubled from each series, going from 1.6 millimeter thick up to 12.8 millimeters, but doubling all the dimensions, including the roller sizes as well. And you can see that when we plot them in this way, scaled 
way, then they all follow the same low displacement curves, but they fail at different points along that load displacement curve. So there is a size effect here. And as we get to bigger specimens, then the strength actually drops off. So to plot that, then we see here, we see that, uh, that there's a reduction in the interlaminar shear strength as the specimen gets larger. And this is not surprising really, because failure is controlled by weakest points due to defects. And as John also mentioned, the, the orientation of the fibers relative to each other can affect the local stress concentrations, which can also have some effect on where that failure initiates. So when you have a larger specimen, then you tend to get a lower strength. So there's often a question about how interlaminar and in-plane shear strengths compare, compare, and one might expect them to be similar. And indeed, some tests have shown that this is the case. Some very nice work from, from Andrew McKay from uh, um, Texas, where he's used DIC with in-plane and interlaminar tests and using nonlinear FE updating. And you can see that the in-plane responses here, the, if you look at the solid line in the middle, these in-plane responses and the interlaminar responses to the shear stress strain curves are extremely similar. And that's probably what we'd expect for a material which is uh, normally transversely isotropic. So that's perhaps not a surprise, uh, but you'd also have to bear in mind that if you have interlayer toughened materials where you have other materials between the plies, then you may not get the same effect. So this is relatively similar. These tests show similar stress strain curves, but if you look at data for strengths, you'll often see differences. And uh, why is that? Well, some of the reasons I'd like to offer why I think are um, in the following slides. So if we look at the short beam shear test, then, and this is true of other tests as well, the shear strength values depend on having the correct stress distribution. So with the short beam shear, then it's normally used the linear um, equation for the shear distribution, which assumes a parabolic shear. And you have this simple equation the shear stress related to the applied load and the dimensions. But nonlinearity of the material changes that maximum stress and that parabolic shear is not no longer valid. And if you look at some FE results we did a long time back, you see that the, the dark line here, parabolic shear, is how the shear distribution is assumed through the thickness, but actually it's much flatter in the middle because of the shear nonlinearity and the value is low. And so the interlaminar shear strength from this test is typically uh, overestimated um, by something around 15%. If you look at the plus and minus 45 test, I'm showing this, this uh, test, very nice work from John, which he showed earlier, then you get this sort of response. And uh, what happens here is when you have large shear deformations, then you have rotation of the fibers and the fibers start to carry a larger tensile stress themselves. And therefore, this value here, the ultimate strength, is, is not uh, valid for the shear. But if you take this, the stress down here, where you start to get the shear failure occurring, then that, that is valid. But it can go beyond that point because you have the bridging fibers, which prevent the, uh, the failure of the whole specimen, even though it may have reached the shear strength within the, the, the material. And in our experience, then you can get consistent values in plane and interlaminar shear uh, if the different properties have been measured carefully. But you do need to consider the size effect. And as well as the size effect on the basic shear strength, which I showed with the interlaminar shear tests, you also have a, a size effect, which is really related to the, the laminate. As John was explaining, because of the different number of plies, the different ply thickness, the effect of edge stresses influencing that, then the final failure will also depend very much on the size of the specimen. That's all I have, thank you very much. There are references in the presentation. Okay, we'll thank you very much. Later. Thank you. Uh, let's move to the last presentation, double green cheer, which we're going to be presented by Gan Thu. Gan, you can uh, share your screen.
Okay, I'm just trying to start it out. Um, okay, uh, can you can you see it? We can see you, not the presentation. Oh, we can hear you, but. Uh... Um, okay, um, I'll go back to share. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay. Uh, am I ready to go? Yes, please go. Okay. Thanks very much, uh, Federico, for the introduction. And I will briefly introduce uh, some of the main features of uh, our double being shear method, which we developed in recent years as one of the new test, uh, testing standards for interlaminar shear mechanical properties. Interlaminar shear properties, especially interlaminar shear strength, are extremely important and to evaluations of resonance system, either in composite structural product development or for cure state validation in composite component manufacturing, and very important to the evaluation for the effectiveness of a stitching, weaving, or incorporating carbon nanotubes ultimately is extremely important to come to structural design, stress analysis, part of mechanical testing and final end modeling. In all experiences and also as reported in open literatures, short being strength method and very often get interlaminar shear strength value overestimated. And for Arsipastical method very often uh, interlaminar shear strength value can be either overestimated or underestimated. In particular, I mentioned underestimation here as, as very often um, one of the notch roots group, uh, could precipitate uh, premature failure. As a result, uh, competitive alternative interlaminar shear test method uh, become uh, very, very desirable uh, to ensure consistent failure of uh, interlaminar shear stress driven delaminations in fiber reinforced uh, composite laminates. I'll summarize the uh, three most commonly used uh, test methods that's uh, SBS, uh, ISPASCO, and notch shear um, across uh, industries along with our double being shear methods. We have also identified five aspects which we could put all methods uh, uh, for comparison and uh, for, for, for their performances. And first one is whether within gauge section, uh, gauge section and gauge section of a test piece, whether interlaminar shear stress region exists or not. Uh, second one is whether such interlaminar shear region, if does exist, uh, would initiate uh, failure. And third one, obviously, is very often demanded by industry. Uh, specimen simplicity is very, very important because top uh, fourth one becomes just important whether we can really trust interlaminar shear strength value. The last one also demanded by uh, designers and final uh, modelers whether uh, we could produce not only interlaminar shear, shear strength but also modulus. As we can see across the board, our uh, double being shear method compares very well against all three methods. Okay, from a um, low right corner, uh, that is uh, what is uh, double beam shear method looks like when it's uh, set up and ready to go in a lab. And up right corner highlights uh, the theoretical features for shear force and button moment distributions uh, within the gauge section. As we can see, we have a two equal spans and, and lows are delivered 
by two identical loads supported by three identical supports in two identical spans. We ended up having four half spans. Uh, if we if we go up to uh, shear force bending moment diagrams at upper right corner, as we can see, two inner spans have a much higher interlaminar shear shear stresses, but also have a two longitudinal sections at which bending stresses are zero. So, which are indicated by those uh, black dash lines. Uh, therefore, it is at uh, those two regions uh, which we very much as uh, uh, confirmed and uh, verified uh, which were responsible for initiating delamination. As we can see from one of our specimens at the lower right corner, and we have made a number of videos and to, to show and delamination indeed started from there. And other advantages of our methods is uh, we have uh, demonstrated consistently a DBS method is accurate and reliable, offer greater interlaminar shear strength value and a lot cheaper than our Pasco method. And we can use the same jig actually perform SBS method as well. In particular, we have uh, consistently failed uh, some, some specimens in delamination which were unable to one SBS method were used. Also uh, within DBS, and um, uh, doesn't matter whether spent with ratio two and a half or five uh, does not produce any difference. Okay, so and the upper right corner shows how interlaminar shear stress is calculated. In order to obtain interlaminar shear modulus, uh, we have developed a little software. In order to use the software, we need some basic mechanical properties, so you want to G1 to new one too. In addition to layup and ply thickness, and also a little bit of setup detail, span length, and loading arm. Ultimately, we need a, a, a measured test curve from LVDT from, from one of the middle distance of one of the inner spans. And finally, I will talk about uh, some of our results of uh, industrial run robbing exercise. We have used uh, five different composite materials, uh, three carbon epoxy based two glass epoxy based and all the panels are autoclave made. Thickness wise vary from two to five and for thin specimens, uh, loader support uh, had a diameter about a three, three mil and for thicker ones we use the six mil. All the span, single span to a thickness ratio of five being used and um, for deflection we, we can use either LVDT or DVRT and um, for a width to thickness ratio, again, we use both two and a half and five. Okay. Again, could, you, could you please conclude? Okay. So, so uh, this is a this is just comparison among all the seven test sites. As we can see, consistency and reliability is excellent as far as interlaminar shear strength is concerned. And this is a this is direct comparison between DBS method. Uh, and SPS method for both thin and thick specimen. From top, we can see our DBS, DBS method fail consistently in, delam in delamination, while SPS very often fail to do that. And also, DBS method consistently produce a substantially greater interlaminar shear, shear, shear strength. And this is just some photographs, which can uh, left hand side shows the DBS. Uh, Test pieces, as you can see, all delamination uh, occurred within the inner regions. And uh, while SPS methods sometimes uh, show delamination um, and may initiate it from free end, uh, while some others uh, simply does not uh, fail in delamination at all. And the bottom one shows one of the Cytex uh, uh, material system, which Cytex had never seen delamination before, which we have consistently produced the delamination using DBS method. Okay, I conclude. The DBS method produced consistent delamination at one of pure interlaminar shear regions for five material systems we have used. And we also produce delamination in some material system which SPS uh, is not able 
to do so. And DBS met their generally greater interlinear share, share strength values for all the comps material system we have used. And DBS has been proven and in terms of data reproducibility and repeatability, and also is independent with thickness ratios. Uh, thanks very much. OK, thank you very much. Uh, okay. You you clearly noticed that we have um, accumulated a significant delay, as we could say, as, as expected or as usual. So what we are going to do is to interrupt here to take a break of 10 minutes. We will continue uh, in 10 minutes, so more or less at 15.45 UK time. And then we will start with the comments, questions, in between the panelists, and then we will open the meeting to everybody, which is something very, very important for this type of meetings. I will see you in 10 minutes. Again, let us start again. And um, uh, what I, I had, um, sorry. What I have in mind is to, that we will start the open discussion at uh, 15.30. With the delay we have accumulated, we are going to change a bit the, um, the order, more than the order, the time devoted to each of the aspects we had originally covered in this damage workshop. First of all, I would like to give some advices for uh, people participating in the discussions. So now we are going to start with the part um, associated with the questions in between the presenters. So the panelists can ask any other, any comment, any uh, uh, additional um, explanation of what uh, has been already done. And later on during discussions, write question and answer or raise hand any time, okay? Please, you chat only for general comment and, and say and to say hi. There are some uh, comments from people that have been using the chat and I will ask them to put the question, to put your comment or question into the question and answer, okay? There is no camera for audience, only micros will be open. We will do it directly after raising your hand. Okay, so uh, panelists, please connect your camera. And we will have about 10, 15, 20 minutes, not too much, because I want to allow attendants to make comments and questions. So who want to start? I have a question. Oh, perfect. Alberto, you start. A question for Marino and Paolo. Uh, is it a difference working with, with glass fiber or composites? I said uh, with glass, you can use this light you showed us inside the specimen, but what about with, with carbon and not transparent? Uh, well, uh, well, maybe let pa uh, let Paolo. Well, Paolo, you can answer if you like. <laughs> you can. Uh, okay. Uh, of course, you cannot use any light uh, with carbon, but uh, it depends. If you want to to test uh, purely UD uh, samples uh, with the fibers at ninety degrees to the axis, uh, then uh, uh, you don't need any tool for damage observation because what you are searching for is just the failure of uh, the the tube. Uh, but if you are uh, analyzing the damage propagation, uh, crack propagation, multiple cracking, because maybe you have also the internal and external uh, fabric uh, or any other kind of uh, layers, uh, then uh, of course you cannot do it with the light, but you need some other systems. But for UD, the, the, the light is not that useful, uh, so you can test uh, carbon based composites as well. Alberto, the, the, apart from the obvious answer to use a micro CT with the problem of going through the thickness of the tube, because uh, it's rather easy to use CT for smaller samples, but you have to be very near to the X-ray source. So even a micro CT is not that uh, easy. 
uh, we we did some um, investigation using infrared tomography and uh, uh, with phase control of the signal. So if you look only to the thermogram, you can see something. But if you go and use the uh, phase of the signal of the temperature, compare the load of the applied load, particularly under sighted loading, you can really identify the something like let's say 0.5 millimeter long cracks. So you can have uh, something even for non-transparent uh, materials. Otherwise, X-rays or micro CT or sound also, but ultrasonic investigation require a quite particular, I mean, setup is always not easy. But I would say that the easiest, I mean, the most in situ test you can, I mean, for, for what we have experience, also acoustic emission, but it's not telling where is happening something. I would say infrared thermography is on board. If you can dismount the sample and see something, you can use a micro CT or X-rays. Okay, any other comment or question? Well, just to follow up on that, I think it's, uh, I guess the question about how you define failure. So what you're saying is you get some small micro cracks, but they don't propagate across the whole specimen. And then eventually, I guess it falls apart. Um, so it comes back to the question about the, the definition of failure. And uh, uh, if you have some small little micro cracks, does it matter? I mean, if you looked at if you looked under a high level magnification, as Federico showed in the previous um, presentation, then you will there'll probably be some very small cracks at the fiber matrix level. But if they don't propagate, what do we take as a shear stress? Uh, well, um, actually, it's a question also to ask others later. Yeah, I have also in mind to, to ask at that point. Actually, uh, Getting back to the original discussion we had during the damage workshop, when, when we, we start to think into the, you start thinking to this uh, solution. Actually, the point is, uh, what about, uh, I mean, about considering also the initiation of failure as a driving mechanism. So even, uh, I mean, in the, as Paulo mentioned, if you're testing a full uh, 90 degree tube, you have no possibility, you have unstable failure. So basically, as far as you see the crack, uh, all the sample is gone. And the same apply if you're testing uh, uh, under shear or under tension, a, a 90 degree uh, uh, oriented uh, laminate. The point is, uh, if you have some way to control uh, the, the damage evolution, even under static loading, you may possibly identify. Well, if it is unstable, there is no initiation corresponded to final failure. So you have strike the, 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 the value. Uh, otherwise, in case of uh, using a particular layup, as in some, uh, I mean, I remember John was uh, saying something uh, using. Uh, a specific app rather than the, the, the full D, uh, and those may be Fabrice. Uh, in that case, uh, you may have something that uh, can occur before the failure. So at that point, uh, we need to define what is, uh, again, the failure stress, uh, but at the same time, it can be interesting to develop a sort of uh, C2D load that can drive the, 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 the failure path until uh, the, this final separation. So having the possibility of monitoring or identifying the dam uh, at the first occurrence, depending on the scale at which you can look at, can be a way to understand better the material response and eventually to decide once you have the full, uh, uh, let's say the full part, uh, what is failure. Remember the, the talk made by Federico about uh, using the, the plus minus sort of test in the industry saying that uh, they stopped the test at a certain amount of strain and then they say, okay, that is the final failure or the, the final stress, which is indeed, uh, I mean, uh, a, a conventional definition of failure. So uh, from my point of view, I believe it's important to understand the much, uh, the, the, the most from, from the, the response of the, of the material and the testing. And then uh, once we have the full picture, decide where we want to, to, to cut, let's say our uh, stress curve. But indeed, uh, it depends on which material you are testing uh, and uh, which tools you have uh, available for, for that specific case. I don't know if I answer you, your point, or I would be happy to have also the, the, the view of our reference here. OK, any other comment? Uh, Michael, I have a question for you. Uh, you mentioned in your first page that you have a large, a medium, and a small size. Could you say something else about uh, what is changed from one situation to the other? So the thickness of each lamina is maintained and when you uh, group is uh, a higher number of plies, 
how do you, let's say, manipulate the uh, laminate to have these three situations? Yes, yeah, so it's just uh, the whole specimen scale more plies. They're unidirectional. So the smallest one was 1.6, and uh, I think that was probably 12 plies. Uh, and then the next one was 24, 48, and 96. And all the in-plane dimensions were also scaled, and the rollers were scaled. So that all the specimens were scaled, but they were fabricated from different plates. We did not cut them. In some of our scale tests, we cut them all from a thick plate. Those ones were not. They were different thickness plates. So any effects of different thickness on the curing might have had some effect, but I don't believe that's a significant issue. So we could be in something similar to what we have noticed in the failure of, um, of transverse failure of a 90 degrees in presence in a laminate due to the thickness effect. Could we- Well, I wouldn't be say it's a thickness similar? effect because uh, the stress distribution is the same. These are UD, materials, there's no uh, uh, in situ effect or anything like that. So I think this is purely down to, to defects. The shear failure starts at the worst defect, whether it's due to a bit of voidage or whether it's to do with the local fiber arrangements, you might not call that a defect, but the variability anyway, uh, it fails at the weakest point. And if you have a bigger volume of material, you're more likely to find a worse point. Yeah. So you can work out a viable modulus and um, you, you could treat it in that way. Okay, any other comment or question? Follow, follow up on that, Michael. You are scaling all three directions, but have you ever tried scaling just one of them? Because I presume that there might be one of the three that's more important than the other two. Um, for example, if you scale, you can, the edge effects could play a good, be different if you only scale the thick, if you only scale the width and not the others, um, and you have the ply thickness effect. Um, that that would also be different whether if you scale that one and not the other two. So, I I don't think because it's a UD. I don't really think that the edge effects are very important for for this case here. Um, I think if you scale the the width, then you risk getting different anti-clastic effects coming in. If you scale the length, well, you want to keep it short because you don't want any uh, risk of compressive failure in particular, but in-plane failure. Now, with regard to, okay, you think it, the failure is controlled by what happens between the plies, but uh, as I showed with the stress distribution, it's actually much flatter. So it doesn't always fail right at the center of the mid-plane because actually, the stress distribution is pretty flat. And we found that we have got failures over quite a large range of the thickness in the region where you had a fairly flat shear stress distribution. So I think it could be interesting to look at the different dimensions, but uh, I don't think it's crucial personally, but I don't know. Yeah, you're right. Uh, okay. can, can, can I jump in? Can I jump in? Okay. Go what ahead. about load transfer issues? I'm not sure what you mean. What sort of load transfer issues? Yeah, okay. So basically, you know, you have a shear stress. Right? And the shear stress can transfer to norm, uh, normal forces. Well, we apply the load through normal forces at the rollers, and that generates a shear stress between the rollers. And it's true that there are other stresses present as well, but the bending stresses are relatively low near the midplane. Of course, as I just said, as you get a variation of uh, the nonlinearity, you may get cracks occurring away from the, the midplane. But I don't think the other stress components are very important in this case. I'm talking about transfer of shear to normal. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't quite understand what you mean. Okay, all right. Let's, let's take a simple example. Okay. You take a simple rod, you stick it in the, into, the, um, into the wall, apply a, a tensile force to it, and the way it is fixed in the, um, uh, in, in the, in the, in the wall, it becomes transport a shear force. Okay. 
you got an idea? So, so that's what I'm finding with my work. I'm finding, you know, with my work, okay, this may not be the case with what you're doing, but what I'm finding in my work is that I'm finding that, you know, um, the conventional wisdom is that the, the failure, sheer failure is dominated by the matrix. Yeah. Okay. Matrix or, or fiber matrix interface, especially with glass, but but generally, I think it's generally agreed that it's matrix dominated. Yeah, I found it was just just not the case. I'm not quite sure how you can make that statement. What what was the uh, um, test? Hey, I got experimental evidence for that. Okay. Okay. So the thing is, basically, uh, I'll, I'll come to that and explain to you, and see if that makes sense. And uh, please, you know, um, be critical about this. Um, I have thermoplastic composites with, you know, I've, I have tested, with, you know, different types of fibers. And what you find is that, like, for example, peak. Peak has got a, uh, the failure of, failure strain of peak is 50%. Okay. And I got things like polypropylene, self reuse of polypropylene, things like that. Uh, the failure strain is very high, more than 50%. But then what you find when you induce pure shear, it fails at 18%. Okay. Um, so this is perhaps a Quite a complex discussion. I'm not sure. Uh, and I think the the effect of other stress components, especially. And I think it was well. Let's let's move on to something else because I think there's a sort of related thing to this, and that's the effect of the other stress components. And I was really interested in what Fabrice showed about the comparison of the the tension and the compression, uh, and the rationalizing between the the different effects and the transverse stresses affecting them, but actually uh, putting them into the equation you got uh, very similar results. And that's also very interesting what Robin Olson mentioned in the chat about comparing tension and compression and also comparing with the Yasupescu. So I guess there's, there is an effect of these other stress components, but it seems that actually you can rationalize. I think this is very, uh, I was very taken with the fact that we can rationalize different tests and get similar values, because that's really what we want. If we've got different tests and they're valid, then we ought to get similar results from the different tests. So perhaps I'd like to, to turn it on to look at something else. So what about the plus and minus 45 tests? There is a little bit of, a, of tension present in that test. Does that affect the interpretation of the failure of the plus and minus 45? But then as uh, Federico mentioned, and, and also I guess the question could be to John as well, well, where do you, where do you take the failure? You know, it's clearly, it's starting to shear, and it's, and, but as, as, as John showed, you've got cracks maybe present right from the beginning due to residual stresses. So where do you take the, the failure and is it influenced by the, the transverse tension, which is also present in that test? I don't know whether John or, or Federico wants to take that. I one. think it's, uh, okay, um, that's, a, that's an excellent observation you're making. Excellent observation you're making, okay? I think that's, what I'm thinking here, I don't know the answer yet, is there's some load transfer issues. Excuse me, I think Gentle had a question pending. Is it okay, are I coming? No, no, it's fine for me. It's okay, it's okay, perfect. Um, well, it's a complicated matter and I think we should open the discussion to other questions. So first of all, before to open the discussion to all the attendants, is there any additional comment or question by the panelists? May I ask you, may I ask another question? Yes. Yes, this is in general, but I was thinking in, in the off axis. So maybe this is a question for Fabrice. Uh, 
some of the test configurations, they are uh, conceived for stiffness determination and, and maybe not for strength. So I, I was thinking, for example, if you use oblique taps and they are based on the stiffness properties of the material, when you reach the level of stresses that you need for strength determination and due to the, to the non-linearity of the, of the shear behavior, you may have another shear stiffness in the material. So maybe this oblique with tap that it was good for stiffness determination is not so good for strength. I don't know if it is, this is correct and maybe it can be extrapolated for all tests, I don't know. I agree, I agree. Okay, uh, Fabrice. Yeah, I think it's a good point. Um, so you might have some damage near the tabs. Yes, can you hear me? No, yes. You are locked. Okay. Now it's. I can't hear you. Fabrice, you want to continue with the word? You want to? Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. You should, no, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I thought. It, yeah, it's a it's a very good point, Alberto. You, you you might have some some damage. I mean, if we look at the nonlinear shear behavior, that might actually result in um, in in a, um, a local reduction of the. Um, of the tangent stiffness and that might actually change indeed the, um, the the material properties and then induce again some sort of extra stress concentration um i think if we were to revisit this with uh, full field measurements now that our techniques are much better and the cameras are much better uh, we could actually look into this uh, the bottom line is the, the the stress concentrations were not very very sensitive to variation of stiffness so we did a, um, a sensitivity study um, when we published this work by varying the stiffness by five or ten percent and um, it doesn't actually change the factors very much but there, surely there must be some some little effect and the fact that when we use the values suggests that we still need so that probably goes in, into what you're saying all right, Marino, I have seen your, your hand. Yeah, well, uh, just uh, a very quick question. Uh, well, that is a comment, basically. Actually, uh, uh, I, I just bef uh, before saying what I, I might to say, just a, a comment on uh, the discussion between Alberto and Fabrice. Actually, is uh, indeed uh, something related to the point we had before, uh, because uh, the damage initiation may be not necessarily the final failure, so this is affecting the chain. Uh, also, something that uh, I uh, I need to say after <laughs> listening to Fabrice, I forgot that something that you can use according uh, to the question before by Alberto over to to um, in front of more is also fulfilled uh, uh, strain techniques because if you have very high resolution, you can maybe recognize something from the outside of the sample in terms of variation of surface or internal cracking. But that is not what I, I, I want to say in this case. Uh, this, we have seen that there is a large variation of results uh, from different test methods. So uh, the, the idea could be interesting. Also, there's something you are just mentioned for uh, the transverse, sorry, for UD strength, just to try to make a comparison and uh, a, a relative assessment. We can suggest for people uh, from the design uh, side uh, just to take one measure. Uh, rather than the other one, and I would be making a sort of scaling parameter, but if you have a, a, a data from a tube, see how they can compare with flat panels or which can be the effect of uh, I mean, the, from the talk of Michael, we have seen that can be significant. Uh, so trying to summarize, uh, because we can, from the scientific point of view, we can really spend days and discuss uh, what we, we can get uh, from a test or from the other, but uh, in view of uh, the application uh, of the data, uh, I would say the need of some, which is basically the reason why this sort of, this set of uh, meetings started uh, can be of interest. And so trying to put some efforts in that direction. Okay, let's open the, the, the workshop to all the attendants. Uh, Federico, John want to say something with it? Sorry, 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 sorry. Michael, is something connected with uh, this question? 
No, I think John has a question. Yeah. I cannot see him. He's waving. Oh. Oh. Off. I'm waving. <laughs> no, no. Sorry, John. It, it was not in my... <laughs> okay. So I, I, I have two hands. John and Michael. Okay. And then we will open to the rest of the attendants. John, go ahead, please. I was trying to be polite, waiting for everyone else. A um, couple of comments uh, based on what's just been said. Um, comment on, Yentl asked about what if you only scale two of the three dimensions. Uh, Yentl, we did such tests a while ago, didn't really notice much difference. This was whether the edge effect was uh, important or not. And Is I think that was because plus minus 45 or 40? Yeah, yeah, plus minus 45. Yeah. Well, actually, for all of the spec, we for we we did a whole lot of uh, different configurations, but the comment on the plus minus 45 degree, um, the the edge effect is on the scale of the size of the ply. And when we looked at the edge effect, say from the displacement, that that operated only on what sort of maybe one eighth or one quarter of a millimeter. Um, and uh, so that re really didn't uh, come into it. Um, another comment um, based on our observation that um, you get this sort of local damage right from the beginning, that's on a fiber level. Um, that uh, those sort of that damage propagates to form little or small delaminations between plies, interlaminar cracks. And it strikes me that certainly in our tests, uh, failure of a sort of macro scale was when those small interlaminar cracks that were the ends of the intralaminar cracks, when they propagated, that was when you got the macro failures. I agree, I agree. But you know, that's because of the material system. Yeah, you've sure. got a material system with this epoxy which is brittle, and you have a fibers that are brittle. If you change the material system to a ductile matrix, like a thermoplastic matrix, and you can use the carbon fibers, glass fibers, this doesn't happen. Well. I, I think I would refer you to, again, work we did and uh, published on uh, Carbon Fiber Peak, where I was kind of disappointed to see similar responses in both the thermoplastic and thermosetting resins. Uh, I've not seen that. Uh, uh, I, I've, I've looked at Peak and Carbon Fibers. I've looked at polypropylene. Polyamide, and you know, uh, I don't see this. No. Michael, you have your yes, hand. I have a question for Gang, and uh, I'm trying to understand the differences between your test and the, the short beam shear. And you mentioned that uh, that in the cases the short beam shear did not give a valid failure. So what what happened? Was this a roller failure? Uh, and if so, can't it be avoided by just using a bigger roller? Yeah, over the years, we have tried all sorts of stuff. We have used bigger rollers. Uh, we, have, we have put a rubber sheets under the roller or even bigger rollers. We have tried all sorts of stuff. Basically, uh, what we have uh, observed consistently over hundreds um, short beam specimens, basically most of the time, uh, delamination either initiated uh, under the uh, 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 central loader or delamination actually initiated from the free end. So, and obviously, uh, and most of the time, you don't, you, you, you don't get a interior delamination. If delamination kind of a, uh, at the end of testing uh, is there, is always uh, extended to the end. And sometimes uh, you're not sure whether actually initiated uh, from, uh, from uh, kind of a kind of free end, which, uh, which isn't supposed to be stressed or Well, I can't or see not. that can initiate from the edge because there's no stress there. But indeed, I, indeed. I find that really surprising. And 
and uh, I've never seen that. If it does, I mean, if it fails in the center, it will definitely go to, or may go to the edge, but I, I can't really see it going the other way around. Have you yeah. got up to tests where it's failed at the edge, but not in the middle? Yeah. Um, all the ones, uh, indeed, uh, it could be just uh, just a kind of a, a strong energy kind of a induced uh, for all the loading and was sufficient uh, to to carry the lamination to them. Uh, that certainly uh, is possibility. So the basically, and and uh, none of them is contained, uh, say, within the gauge, gauge section. All right. Let open the microphone to everybody. OK, so first of all, I have three hands. Uh, Robin also, three friends. Robin also. <laughs> Elena Correa and Paul Brosted. So Robin has also a question for Gangzu. I don't know if it is the same uh, question you are going to explain us. Robin, you can speak. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes I, I can. I can. Yeah, no, it's not the same question. I guess the question to Gang can he can answer by by just written text. My uh, qu comment is another actually. I was it was a very nice review paper. You had three page on on different shear testing, but I must say I was a little bit sad to see that the work done on shear testing at KTH in Stockholm by uh, Professor Neumeister and his PhD students, it was completely missed for some reason. Uh, I mean, actually, there was one student, uh, Niklas Melin, who did a very interesting modification <laughs> the geometry of the Josepesco specimen, where he showed both by FE and experimentally that you can get much higher strength and much more uniform stresses and strains by modifying the angle of the tropic scaling of the of the notch angle. And I think that's really important. It has to be considered. Uh, and the other thing was actually a thesis by by um, Kai Petterson uh, on this inclined double notch shear test. Uh, which was developed both for tension and compression. And it's actually a, a, a sort of interlaminar strength test, which I think is pretty neat if you want to do. It's not such an easy test as a short beam shear test, but it's uh, or the other SBS test, but it's uh, they did a lot of useful work there. But mainly I, I was sort of, I felt that it's, been missed that you can improve the Josepesco shear test a lot by changing the geometry. They also improve the test rig actually. We have used that in our institute. So I guess it's mainly a comment or question to Adams that he's not here. Yes, Dan Adams. Maybe someone else can answer. Uh, can, I, can I try, try that? And obviously, in all experiences uh, before, um, and actually before the development of our DBS method, uh, we have used uh, our SPASCO quite extensively. So over the years, and the part of our original thoughts uh, come from detailed observations. Our SPASCO, whether, whether you use a larger specimen, which is a 19 millimeter uh, thick now, nowadays or, uh, or um, um, half inch specimen. And the one big problem is, uh, is uh, there, there's a very little chance to avoid uh, pre premature failure, which initiates from one of the notch roots. We have done extensive uh, 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 observations uh, putting samples underneath microscopes. Very often we observe two notches. Very often don't end it up at exactly the same material characteristic. Say one notch could be right within the fiber toes and the opposite side is actually ended up in the resin. 
So very often that that created a um, kind of a good chance for premature failures. Uh, in our experience, and the overwhelming majority of occasions, well, we don't even recall saying say interlaminar shear failure at the middle middle uh, middle region between two notch roots. Um, we did not even remember we've seen that. Most of the time, it's just, uh, if not one notch, it will just be the other uh, started showing delamination. So that, that, that is one of the major problem for all the notch-based methods, well, in our experiences. All right. Now is the turn for Paul Bronsted. Paul. You can speak now. Can you hear me? Yes. Good. Hello, all of you. Nice to see yeah. you again. <laughs> Long time. Uh, I have followed your discussions and presentations. And uh, well, there's not much new in the, in the test methods. And uh, you have all presented different test methods. And then you design your uh, layout or the architecture to your method. In the applications uh, where I worked, um, we need we have a, a fixed architecture, and then we need some tests to test them, and we also need tests to test larger specimens. You know, uh, my career was in in wind and uh, blades, and they are getting bigger and thicker and uh, but uh, it appears to me that uh, all your uh, tests, they are requiring uh, uh, some uh, specific uh, architectures or layout. So a more generic test method, uh, and how can we measure on, uh, on say, uh, different types of laminates with the same test? That's one of my comments, and also, so of course, if you have comments on that, then uh, uh, for the last couple of years, I have uh, worked with uh, larger panels, uh, but I haven't found anything. But my thought was, uh, could you imagine using for uh, for a panel or a plate uh, a four corner bent test? So you put put a bent test in uh, support in four corners. And then uh, in that plate, you will introduce a lot of shear. I haven't seen it. I haven't found anything in the literature, but uh, uh, it could be very nice with uh, analysis and the stress analysis on, uh, on panels like that. It could also be used for, uh, uh, for evaluating, uh, for instance, uh, repairs. You put a repair in a big panel and then you could uh, uh, try to test it in a sort of, I would call it a four corner plate bent test. So that, these are my comments now. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank you. Can, can I just make a comment there? That the, uh, the, the results I showed from uh, Andrew Makeff were, were on a, a plate, which was a, a, a twist plate as you were, um, I think as you were suggesting. And he measured both the in-plane and the interlaminar on the same specimen, which I think was a really interesting test. And uh, as, it, as I showed in my presentation, got a very similar stress strain response. Um, if I'm allowed, can I ask a question, Federico? Um, it's an open question for, for a number of people. Uh, Paul, you, you raised the issue about the layup. And I think this has also been mentioned by several of the speakers today. And should we be using a, a cross fly? Uh, Gang, when you were talking about failures at the notch, I wasn't quite sure whether you were talking about a, just a UD uh, or whether you were talking about a cross ply. Uh, but Dan had showed that the stress concentration was much lower um, when you had a um, cross ply. And uh, he also showed some quasi isotropics, which I think that's a whole other question. But what about uh, several speakers have mentioned this? What layout should we be using for measuring shear? Should we be measuring a UD? Or should we be measuring a, a cross ply or what should we be doing? Uh, I think it's irrelevant. 
It's irrelevant. Okay. The idea, I think he is asking a very important question. The question that he's asking is, how do you use and design structural components? That's what we should be asking. Can I chip in to answer Marco's question Sorry. directly? One, one second, one second, Gang. Marino okay. has already the, the hand raised. Marino, it's your time. All right. We'll go yeah, with actually, uh, I take the occasion, eyeball, nice to, to hear you at least since a while. I take uh, the occasion of a work we did in the past with Paul, Bent, all the friends in um, <clears throat> Rizzo, with Paolo, Ramesh, uh, just comparing the effect of the tubes uh, and uh, samples. Uh, just to try to answer to the, the, the point raised by, by Michael. Actually, playing with the layup, uh, uh, as we uh, uh, at that time was meant uh, to, to find a different uh, local uh, multi axial stress level, changing the orientation of apply. But uh, uh, being, for instance, a zero theta um, plus minus theta, whatever you want, you can uh, really find a combination of stresses that can really bring you in specific uh, conditions. Uh, actually, I don't remember by memory the plot, but uh, I'm sure that there are conditions where you are near zero in terms of other components and the shear. Uh, so basically testing the, the choice of a laminate layup can be done based on the application, as was mentioned. But at the same time, from, uh, let's say, a more uh, scientific point of view, can allow the, 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 the test to be made in order to identify some specific condition. So uh, in that case, I mean, the choice can have a different uh, situation because at the end, uh, as um, Fabrice was pointed out, uh, you have to clean the, the data before, uh, sorry, after the test, taking out the different components of the stress test, sorry, the stress, uh, the stress component not want to have inside, but you cannot avoid for the specific layout. But playing with the layout, you can really try to drive the, the, the test direction of the results in the condition of the web. And that again was uh, taking, a, this was done in the past, taking advantage of the work done by, by Paula and, and friends at Rizzo. Okay, I have uh, Gan first and then Fabrice. Gan, okay. please. Thanks, Federico. And, and also, also, this should also uh, refer to Paul's earlier question. I think, uh, in all development, I think we always used uh, not only just UD, a uh, cross ply and quasi-tropic uh, laminates consistently all the way through. So uh, that is one of the basic material kind of considerations uh, we have had um, for, well, uh, right from the beginning and all the things. And uh, indeed, as you, as you suggested, it could, uh, it could uh, it could be some uh, minor differences, but but what I said uh, with regard to premature failures, they are usually more or less independent layups. So things uh, we observe premature delaminations, uh, uh, in particular, say from Arcipasco specimens, uh, they they. They always occur, whether it's crop fly or quasi tropic or UD. Thank you. Fabrice. Fabrice, can you hear me? Unmute. Yeah, I just wanted to. Re yes, okay. I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, go ahead. Uh, I, I have. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Okay. okay. I, I wanted to um, come back on the to the question that uh, that Michael just asked about, you know, we, which layup. And I, I think we um, I think we need to go back to what we're trying to do. Generally, when we are when when we try to determine a strength, what we're actually doing is identifying um, a parameter of a model. So. I mean, this is something we haven't really spoken very much about, but um, what, what um, uh, underpins a lot of the presentation we've seen was a model, a ply level model that we're trying to populate with these strength values. Uh, but sometimes that's not enough. Um, and for instance, if you have other more complex 
configurations, you might need other ingredients, like to take into account the, uh, the size effects, for instance. And so I think whenever we, we are trying to identify a parameter, we need to make sure we understand the model we are identifying. Sometimes by thinking about material properties, we have a tendency to lose the fact that we are identifying a model. Even Young's modulus is linked to a model. And I think that these questions about which layup should we use, et cetera, I think the question is which model do we want to identify? And then, you, and then depending on that, you can design your tests um, based on that. Uh, just another uh, remark as well about uh, what has um, arisen many times during this discussion about the fact that it's difficult to get a pure uh, shear stress state. And indeed it is. Uh, there are uh, many reasons for that, but one of the reasons is because when you have uh, flat edges with the free edge conditions, your shear stress uh, is zero at edges. And so it's very difficult to have a, uh, um, um, a flow of shear stress somewhere that is uniform when you have zero at the edges. And that's true for many of these shear tests. In fact, um, if your shear stress is not uniform, if you look back at the mechanical equilibrium equation, it tells you that necessarily to balance the gradients of shear stress in the one or two direction, you also need other stress components, sigma one, one, and two, two. So in a way, these two things are linked together. And I think now that we have full field imaging capabilities, maybe we should rethink about these tests, not so much trying to focus on getting this, chasing this unicorn of the, um, the um, uniform and, um, and, and uh, uniaxial shear stress, but rather how can we use this wealth of information together with the models we try to identify to, uh, to develop new tests um, that would um, uh, rely less on assumptions and more on, on measurements. I have done that. Okay, I, I, I fully I have agree that. With, with your comment, Fabrice, particularly with uh, the identification of uh, where you are going to use your value because this will allow you to identify the best test for satisfying the requirements. Uh, first of all, I would like to say something that Gentle and Michael will subscribe for sure. Uh, Robin told us that, you know, we have missed some important references. Uh, I remember that Michael wrote in the first workshop one page. When I wrote these notes, I said, Michael, it is impossible to, to mention relevant works in one page. And we move to five pages. We, of course, apologize for any missing. We may have in making the, the summary, but you know we are not uh, doing uh, a particular summary of what has been done in determining the strength, but just to introduce the matter, now to discuss it, uh, the details. Anyway, do I have any hand? No, I have... Uh, uh, one question by Robin Olson. Remember that you can either raise your hand or write a question. I have one from uh, Robin Olson. It's a comment to Dan Adams, Gang Thu, and all. Very important improvement on the IOCPSQ specimen geometry test rig and procedure were suggested by Neumeister and Melling. I'm aware of this work. Uh, and there is a a couple of references. By explicitly modeling the premature crack of, at the notch root in finite element, we have shown that it has a very small influence on the shear stress distribution in the IOCPSQ gauge section. Okay. Right. So now at present moment, we are in peace. So I have the hand of Fabrice. Fabrice, go ahead. Yeah. Um... Yeah, just to say that I, I fully agree with, um, with Robin. Um, it, this is a finding that um, um, I, I found as well a long time ago when I published a paper in 96, where um, if you actually model uh, this, 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 I don't know whether you, may, maybe I can use the, uh, oh no, because I've got, um, yeah, never mind. You, you, can actually, you can actually remove the bit that prematurely cracks at the, at the notch and, and sort of flatten the two regions. You can remove that bit of material, it doesn't do anything. And in fact, it creates a more uniform state of, um, of shear between the notches. Um, so it does improve it uh, a bit and you don't, you don't get this, this load drops when the specimen loads, which I think is much easier also 
to, uh, to get the nonlinear sh shear uh, stress strain response because you don't have to account for the stress redistribution in between. But nevertheless, you don't have pure and uniform shear. Okay, any other, we still have time for some comments or questions? We don't have uh, questions open from the audience. I have one. Who has his hand up? Paul. Paul, go ahead, please. Paul, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, open the okay. microphone. Perfect, okay. perfect. You can well, speak now. I'm, of course, always provoked by <laughs> things like that, that uh, when you're talking about the not specimens, then you're also localizing uh, your uh, deformation or stress zone very much. So in a, in a composite, where you have a big variation in uh, quality and fiber content and things like that, then uh, I still... Uh, look for a, a more global uh, stress introduction to shear instead of the local ones. So do you have any, any comments on, uh, on that? Because you have a test a lot of UC PESCO to get a, a, a viable distribution of the stress in, on the strength, for instance. For instance. Can I jump in here? Yeah. I, I think excellent question. Excellent question. That is the way we want to look. We want to look at a stage where we want to be looking at a performance of a structural component and a design. Not at, you know, testing, you know, um, per shear or, you know, whatever. They're important, they're important, but they have to be built into some kind of a design tool. I hope, I sincerely hope that could be, you know, a topic of a future workshop. It's not easy. Well, perhaps moving on towards the uh, um, future perspectives, I think I would just like to ask people about the status of, of round robins. So on the, as Federico mentioned, uh, Yentl has been taking a lead on, on organizing this round robin on tensile strength. And uh, I'm not familiar myself with what has been done in recent years, if anything, on round robins on shear. Um, Gang mentioned uh, what, what he's doing, but particularly just comparing different test methods. Because the thing I've found most interesting from this discussion is the that we have had a few examples of different test methods, which apparently may give similar results, which I think is, is great. And I think that's something we want to build on. But what has been done before? Is anybody able to comment on the state of the art with regard to comparisons and round robins? Yes, uh, if we are going to enter into the last part, <laughs> I have- well, I don't know, it's premature, I, but it's, a, it's a leading right. into it. You are right because uh, I had the, the idea to ask a similar question. Do you consider, in, Michael is asking, are you aware of any, any particular development in this sense? And my question is complementary. So do you think that we could organize something in the near future to cover most of the question we have set up? I would like to, to, to gentle to explain the difficulty. So the, the job he's doing now, but with one particular test, only one test, okay? And we are a gentle six, seven, eight um, uh, group of people participating and the, the job is incredible. So imagine if we have to do something similar with five different uh, approaches to determine S, the job is going to be very, very extremely difficult and will take several years. Gentle, you want to say, to mention something? Um, yeah, 
<laughs> the fact that you're absolutely right, um, do, doing this in a proper, consistent manner for, for pen cell testing is already very difficult. And, and I think despite the difficulties in pen cell testing in Sheen, I think it's going to be significantly more complicated because at least we have somewhat of a uniform stress in pen cell testing, but we can get somewhat close to it. But in, in Sheer, we kind of know that it's impossible to get something that's really truly uniform. So mm -hmm. yeah, I think it would be very interesting, but um, I, I'm not going to leave that round for <laughs> Okay, I, have... I don't think, um, in my opinion, there's no, no such thing as peer share, and you know, it's, everything is combined loading in structural analysis. Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, that that is the, that should be the fundamental thing that we want to look at, and that's what thing, uh, you know, what he was asking about before. Okay, if you're going to go and say I'm going to do tensile testing, compression testing, pure shear testing. Hey, what does it all mean? Hmm. Okay, have one hand from Graham Sims. Graham, you are allowed to speak. Open the microphone, please. Graham. Bottom left corner, okay. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we. you can speak. Okay, so uh, those who know me, uh, know that uh, I do a lot of work in ISO on test methods. Uh -huh. and, uh, we have a directive from ISO that we should do uh, round robins on all new test methods and when test methods come up for their five-year revision. And uh, so we have recently done a large uh, round robin on through thickness properties, both in tension and compression. Um, and we we're about to do one on compression in plane, uh, ISO 14126, uh, which is having a slight rewrite. Um, but it's very critical that we get this precision data and you should be able to look into the current versions of these standards and find that there is precision data given It's not a cheap exercise, all short. And uh, so it does cost money and it relies on the industry giving a certain amount of support in general. Um, but the last one on through thickness in the Z direction was uh, run and funded by NPL. Has that been published, Graham? Um, yes, because the sand is out there. I mean, we've, oh, it's, in, it's in the stand. Okay. Sometimes you can sort of put uh, add the precision data within a year or so, um, so you get the document back out. Um, but uh, normally it should be there all the modern ones as they go through a five year revision. Okay. Any comment? Any further question? So we should enter into the last part of the of the meeting, which is conclusions and suggestions for next steps. So any any coming in the sense is uh, welcome. I have take, been taking notes, but the, the the summary of the conclusion is the list of things we have to consider is very similar to the one we had when we started, because we have not solved any, any particular question. But uh, it's clear to me that the needs are, we need to, to, we would need to have pure state, only shear stress component. And if not, at least to have higher values from shear stresses than other stress component. If we don't use UD laminates, we need to study or to, to clarify the effect of a stacking sequence. The role of other stress component at failure, this is very important, and it's very important to define what do we want to understand by failure? Because uh, as I said in, in the introduction, I was, after being for 15 years, 
performing tests for the aeronautical industry. I have noticed last Friday when I asked them about some comments that the use they are doing of the property we measure is secondary. So basically what they use is the value of the deformation in the direction of the fiber that each lamina can suffer without damage, okay? This is my experience. If anyone has a different impression, I'm ready to hear. So what does it mean that in fact, the value we, I mean, we are taking a lot of care in, in, in many aspects. And at the end of the day, what they use is a, a very uh, reduced information from everything we are doing. And I don't know if knowing this, we are able to do something to, um, to satisfy their requirements. Or at least if we were able to find one situation in which not having reached the limit value of the deformation in the direction of the fiber, S, sorry, uh, sigma reaches a value higher than S producing a failure not, con not uh, observable with the uh, procedure uh, they use in the um, aeronautical industry. Uh, obviously, to me, the, the, the effect of uh, the role of size effects is also an important uh, uh, point of study in determination of the strength. And finally, taking again the idea that Fabrice put on the table, if we have different uh, schemes to determine one property, we need to use that which represents better the performance of our lamina in one particular structure. This is not easy, don't ask me how to do it, but uh, it is something that I think we also should work on this in the future. And now it is time for you to say some additional conclusion, comments, and of course, if you have, uh, we have started the discussion. If you have an idea about uh, the possible performance of a round robin in this, uh, parcel of composite and um, particularly how to do it, to combine different results from different tests or to take a test and make uh, a round robin just particularly for this test. It would be helpful for Gentle, for Michael and for me to uh, hear your comments because our plan is after in the, along the next week, we will write something derived from this uh, workshop and then we will decide also in the near future how to proceed. So now the micros are open for any comment or question. Can I can I add a, a few words from our uh, round robin experience? Yes. Um, I was I would uh, I would say when the, uh, when better than anticipated. And uh, well, that was uh, that was all participants' uh, feedback. And what we did, I think, uh, uh, um, some of the key points uh, I feel, which uh, which are very important, is uh, uh, test pieces production. So that must that must be controlled uh, very well, and who makes it and how they should be made must be agreed by all all participants and testing methods, produce uh, procedures, uh, testing machines, and even operation procedures got to be understood by all, all participants. Sometimes different people doing it differently, that would, uh, that would just uh, add uh, on a, vo well, say, on intentional data variations, say, if sort of uh, unaware and uh, what what should have been done? So, um, that so these are these are some of the sort of a testing and operational procedure. Then final, then it goes to final data interpretations. Uh, if we ex expect all testing sites of uh, of uh, participants to do preliminary data processing, so that that becomes extremely significant. So sometimes, unless all participants know exactly how how to work out either 
strength of modulus uh, based on precisely what sort of a, 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 a standards. Sometimes that could add a very significant variations in, in post-processed data. So that is, uh, that is all experience. I'm very, very controversial Thank you. Here. Thank you. Go, Go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. I'm very, very controversial here. We've been doing this since my PhD days. Okay. We have never resolved anything. We have not resolved anything in the last 30, 40 years. I say that my, my, my main problem that I'm seeing here is you have a Brittle matrix in epoxy, a brittle, you know, carbon fiber, okay, with extremely dissimilar mechanical properties. Predicting the life and effective usage of that is going to be extremely difficult. Extremely difficult. Let's change the game. Why don't we use a ductile matrix, like a thermoplastic matrix, and a strip fiber? I have found in my research, I have found in my research that thermoplastic composites are more damage tolerant. They are more amenable to manufacturing defects. You can have micro cracking but they don't spread. I have, I have data to prove it. I got DIC data to prove it. Okay, so why do we keep on going do this? Laminate this, laminate that, you know, notch this, shears and this, you know, everything, okay? We've gone through three worldwide failure exercises, completely inconclusive. Nothing has worked. Let's change the game. Let's see if we can use a different material system. Yeah, a ductile um, matrix, with, you know, with a um, with, with a you know high fiber, which is more damage tolerant, fundamentally more damage tolerant. No, thank God. To to respond to one of your first points, the fact that we have not made progress on shear testing in the last 30 to 40 years, I definitely do not agree with that. I mean, you still see new test methods being developed, but the ones that we are using now, uh, I think are better than the ones we had 40 years ago. And we also understand the ones that we have nowadays better than 40 years ago. So I do think we have made significant progress, uh, even though absolutely. we're not there yet. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree with you. That's a, a, you are spot on there. We are doing extremely well. But, you know, when you go back, when I go and talk to people in Boeing, they say they will only use quasi-isotropic laminates. That's it. Extensive testing, extensive testing, over designed. Okay, why? Because you know, all the research we have done, all the things that we are, you're, you're spot on, Intel, you're spot on. You know, we have done a lot of, there are a lot of fantastic people here. Every one of you is great, doing extremely well. But you know, we're not providing the industry with the tools to optimize the design. That is my issue. It is not about testing methodology. It is about changing the paradigm. Yeah, well, one thing that we haven't discussed as extensively this time as in the last workshops is this issue of, is, is the shear strength really a material parameter or is it more a structural parameter? And I think that's, that's more an issue here than it is with, with tension and compression where I think there is a possibility to measure a real material parameter. We in shear strength, I have some more doubts so that you can never really expect to measure a pure material parameter. 
I agree. I, I agree with you. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you on that. I, I'm, I'm just kind of, that, that's why I said, you know, when I said that, I said, I want to be controversial here. Okay? I'm just saying, like, come on, let's think differently. Let's think out of the box. Forget about, you know, laminates. Forget about, you know, you know, uh, all the things that you've been doing. Hey, can we do it differently? It's always good to consider different ways of doing things. And uh, I think there's, there's some real issues about uh, the, the relevance when, when we, industry is using laminates, multi-directional laminates, as you said, um, but we still have a, a, a interlaminar failure. So the shear failure is, is perhaps more important for interlaminar. Uh, and of course, there's another issue is that a lot of people would argue that if you're gonna get a shear failure, you haven't designed your structure properly is what we should do is make sure the loads and the layups are such that we don't get a shear failure. So I think there are the different questions regarding design, but nevertheless, I still feel it's important that from a fundamental point of view that we understand the shear behavior and then we can hopefully develop the models where we can use it in predicting the high level performance, but we're not there yet. I think we're making some good progress and perhaps we've had a few new ideas. I'm heartened, as I said earlier, by the fact that we've had a few cases of uh, uh, Robbins and, and Fabrice's were getting, being able to rationalize some different tests with similar materials. And I would like to see some more tests. I'd, I'd be very interested, Robin, to compare your data with the plus or minus 45. I mean, maybe you've already done that, I don't know. But I think there's uh, clearly a lot more work to do, but I think we are making some progress. I agree, I agree. Okay. Uh, uh, I think, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, you know, I'm being a devil's advocate here. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I'm being a devil. See, you, uh, you're asking me to do, you know, hey, what do you want to do? I'm just saying, look, throw everything away. Let's okay, you know? it, is, it is very difficult for us to change some things. For instance, the material, the material system is decided by the companies and they move in a certain direction, sometimes completely different to what we think. Look, I have been the last five, 10 years working on ultra thin plies and the person responsible for taking a similar decision in a big, big, big company, an industry in, in the aeronautical uh, um, world are moving exactly, they are my students. So they are moving exactly in the opposite direction. I tried to convince them that using ultra thin plies, the damage uh, will delay, the appearance of the damage will delay. They are moving in a completely different direction. And there are many questions that in the last 10 years or even more, 40 years, when I started with John Morton in Virginia Tech, I heard that this is the end of this uh, use, for instance, autoclave, or the use of fibers, or the use of uh, thermoset metrics, and everything is similar to more similar what uh, with what what happened thirty years ago. I have one hand, Fabrice. Probably this will close the uh, the dummy workshop. You have now the word. Okay, big responsibility there. Um, no, ju just again uh, about what Michael said. I, I think. Um, this is indeed very interesting and Ron Robin are generally organized so that um, everyone does the same test. Uh, but maybe we should look at it from a different angle, like uh, have a, a big bunch of, um, of, of pre-preg uh, plates done for us and spread that around and people trying to use different tests. And ideally, if we read these tests properly, properly and we have a unified model behind, we should be able to retrieve the same value for the property. And I think that would question not only the test, the way we do the test, but I agree with Riental. I think we've done a lot of progress and people understand their test much better than they used to. I think what is not very well understood is the mechanical analysis of the test and how you extract the property from the model. If you take a plus or minus 45 degree, for instance, the shear stress is, the in-plane shear stress is one of the parameters that drives the response, but there are others on top of it. The mechanical model in a way is much more complex because you have interlaminar properties uh, residual stresses, etc. But it is still in there. So how can we extract it? But if we extract it, we should have the same property if our model is sound, 
uh, as we have with an off axis or Yosipescu or rail shear, etc. And I think that would be very interesting because it will probably teach us a lot more about the test methods themselves um, by sharing our experience and our data uh, uh, across different test methods on the same material. So that's a good idea, okay? But how will you use it? All right, so it is exactly, uh, according to my watch, is exactly 18 uh, in Belgian time, in Europe time. So thank what you. What do you have in Australia? Thank you very much to all of you for your contributions. And uh, you will receive our news in the near future about conclusions, what to do in the future, and so on. Thank you very thank much. You, sir. For and the presentations will be made available on the website as well, on the web. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Bye. Good morning.